Yes, my name is Andy Lowell. I was assigned to the 453rd Bomb Bombardment Group of the 2nd Combat Wing of the Mighty 8th Air Force. I joined them in September of 43, progressively moved from Assistant Group Operations Officer to Squadron Commander, and then to Group Operations Officer. I joined as a First Lieutenant, was promoted in a couple of months to Captain, and in Ju May of 1944, I was promoted to Major while I was a squadron commander. In July, I was moved up to become the group operations officer of the 453rd. On the 31st of July, I was scheduled to be the command pilot <coughs> of the second combat wing, which was leading the second air division. So I left my 453rd bomb group, traveled to Hethel early in the morning to meet the crew with whom I was to fly because they were a Pathfinder crew, which belonged to one of the squadrons of the 389th group. I m went to the briefing and then met the crew with whom I was to ride, probably just 20 minutes before takeoff. The aircraft commander was a Captain Robert Lamb. His crew had come over with the 458th bomb group and then had been transferred up to 389th. They were on their 25th mission. So I just joined them. I, as a command pilot, then rode the right seat. And when we finally, finally were squared away, we had 274 airplanes that morning in the 2nd Air Division. It was the 31st of July, 1944, payday, and we were striking the target just about noon. The target that day was the IG Farben Chemical Works at Ludwigshaven, right on the Rhine River. But we took flak, and we were very high, the highest I had ever flown, 24,000 feet for the lead airplane. And we took flak from the initial point all the way into the target, but <clears throat> it was a type of flak that um, gave you problems, but nothing too serious. We had shut down the second engine by the time we were on the bomb run, but just about a minute before uh, bombs away, uh, we took a terrible burst in the bomb bay, which broke our hydraulic fluid uh, container and set us on fire. So we were badly on fire the last minute or so of the bomb run, it was too late to turn it over a deputy, so we stayed in there, flying on two engines, on fire, and we did get bombs away. As soon as bombs were away, we dove out of the formation. Uh, the aircraft commander warned his people that he did not want them to jump out in the target area, that he hoped he could clear the target area just a little. So we flew <clears throat> probably two or three minutes. He sounded the alarms, and we bailed. Now, in my case, we were up in the flight deck and a tremendous fire in the bomb bay. Literally, it was almost impossible to force yourself to go through that fire to the bomb bay. The door was closed. I opened it and looked, closed it again. But on the flight deck then were the two pilots and the Mickey operator. So the Mickey operator is the radar navigator for us. He was a very short man. But just in a few minutes, I looked around that airplane. I had been through the emergency procedure school on the B-24, so although I didn't have much flying time, I, had, I knew the airplane very well. And I had a lot of flying time in the B-17s. There was a top hatch on that airplane, which is not an egress in the air. But I opened the hatch, and it was great to feel that cold air. And I grabbed the Mickey operator around his legs and threw him through the hole. Two of the engines were shut down, so really we didn't have to worry about those propellers. We were forward of the propellers. I went right behind him, and the aircraft commander, Cap Captain Lamb, followed me out, and he was badly burned on his face. I landed um, across the Rhine, outside the city of Mannheim, and I would guess that in 30 or 40 minutes, they had picked up almost all of the crew. So there were 11 of us they picked up. We were put in a little civilian jail, uh, stripped of things that uh, we were carrying, which looked like a government issue. Those are all taken from you by your captors. Mine were two Landsturm soldiers, which is like a state militia of older men, rifle, armed with rifles and bayonets, who were very worried that I was carrying a pistol, which I was not. But I was badly burned then, and my flying suit was still burning. So they put down their rifles and helped me put the fire out. Then they took my candy bar. And it turns out I was wearing my West Point ring, so they took that. They took my GI watch. 
and what other equipments I had in my pocket. We were taken to a little civilian jail, <clears throat> and then uh, two or three hours later, uh, the German army, the Wehrmacht, came with a truck to take us to an airfield nearby. We had a terrible time getting out of that civilian jail. We had probably a hundred people beating us up. Uh, got us into the truck. Uh, they had bandaged me some in the, in the little c civilian jail, so I think that took the edge off the crowd when I came out uh, bandaged up. We got into the truck, they took us to the base. I was then taken to a flight surgeon, a German officer, captain, who spoke excellent English. And he told me that he wondered about where the war was going. He did ask me if I had a family. I told him yes. Uh, I was aware, you know, his name, rank, and serial number, but I hardly felt that he was an interrogator. So he treated the wounds. He cut away all the uh, clothing, and he uh, put on medicine under the burns, bandaged me with uh, paper bandages, and then they took me to a little cell, which would be like the guardhouse on that German field. The next morning, a guard came, got me, marched me back to that same captain, Feltwebel, doctor, who said he could do nothing for me, but um, he thought I'd like to get out of the guardhouse, that I was going to be in jail pretty soon. So they came and got us again, took us into Frankfurt. From Frankfurt, we went north to a place called Uber uh, Oberusel, which is the interrogation center. There they asked my name, rank, and serial number, and I told them when I was a major, and I told them my name, and I told them my serial number. But I was a 453rd bomb group representative flying with a 458th crew in a 389th airplane. So there was some confusion about who I was, and so they immediately told me that I had to tell them more about my unit that they did not treat spies. So I could not get medical treatment until they knew who I was. Well, this went on for five days, and I was tied up. So they had to let another prisoner out to feed me. They had to let another prisoner out when I had to go to the, use the facilities, and I literally became a terrible mess. On the fifth day, when I walked into the usual routine of the interrogation, the Hauptmann, the captain, the interrogator, had right on his desk a folder that said 453rd Bomb Group on it, so I knew that um, <clears throat> they figured out who I was. So they asked me some more questions, and they asked me about um, uh, some of the people in the bomb group, and then they told me, because they now know who I was, I was to cross the street, go to the transient camp, and there I would get medical attention. I crossed the street, and there, just inside the gates, was a captain they'd also caught, a fighter pilot, who had been missing for three months that we know of. He happened to be a West Point classmate of mine, and at one time we'd lived together in the barracks. He had been free, had Turkish papers, had a job in a factory in, in Belgium, but somebody finally turned him in. So he had just been caught, and he was just ahead of me. So Scotty took off all my bandages, took off all my clothes, and I sat there, au naturel, right in the middle of this town, in an August day, while Scotty washed all my clothes, washed all the bandages, and then bandaged me up again. And then we were told we were going to the permanent camp, and we went all the way across Germany and into Poland, and we were taken to what became Stalag Luft Stammenlager der Luftwaffe, so that's an Air Force camp, number dry, Eins Vi dry, number three. When we got there, the camp had already you know, like 10,000 prisoners, so uh, the American compounds were very full, and we were told we were going into the British compound. But I went then into the hospital first, and I then spent about six weeks in the hospital. Then I was turned back into the camp, and I lived with uh, uh, British roommates and one American, a fighter pilot. Uh, then the British cleaned out a barracks of anyone who was senior to me, and I then became the senior officer of Barracks 107, and that put me as a barracks commander under the camp council. So it gave us an American voice in the British compound administration. And when I moved to the uh, command, barracks commander's room, I had room for one other person, so I asked my classmate Scott to join me. So it was Major Lowe and Captain Scott who lived in that room.
and I was the barracks commander. Um, busy, <clears throat> the British had a very nice school going, and I went over to see if I could help with them. The Americans decided they would want to take some courses, but we found out that they spent too much of their period uh, trying to convert pounds, shillings, and pence to American dollars and cents, and particularly the metric system. So I decided we really ought to have an American school system, so I became what was the superintendent. There was another major there by the name of Lenfest, a fight pi fighter pilot, who had graduated from West Point behind me and was an excellent mathematician. So he and I really put the school together. We taught math right through calculus, because most of the American officers were, some had a two years of college, but many were just high school graduates then that the Air Force had been willing to take. So we had a very nice school going. <clears throat> we were responsible also for um, recreation. I was on the policy camp, council of the camp, but the, the British are great about being uh, sure that you share only with people what they really need to know. So even though I was a council member and I suspected from my council meetings uh, that we were doing something to get out of the camp, I was never too sure. Now Stalag Lift 3, the north compound, was the location of the entrance to the tunnel of the Great Escape. The Great Escape took place on 24th of March 1944 and I didn't arrive there till August. But while I was in the hospital and they weren't watching me one day, I got into a supply room and there were 50 urns. That's the cremated remains of the 50 who were shot for the Great Escape. So as I went into camp being an American officer, fairly senior officer, <clears throat> we were responsible to keep people uh, encouraged to escape if it made sense. But by the same token, we were begin to urge caution that it was sort of dumb to be alive and in the prison camp and then go ahead and get yourself killed. It was pretty sure we were already on the continent that the war was probably going to be over. So our rallying cry became home alive in 45. Some people did try to escape, but um, we literally uh, told them not to go out and get themselves killed. So that was part of it. So it was from the Great Escape. The tunnel was found, as you recall, uh, only three of the 76 who got out ever reached England. One of them was a Dutchman. So <clears throat> I knew that something was being done, and I also knew that we had to be sure there was always a play running in the theater. It was just a very fine theater. The British were very enthusiastic about this and literally put on excellent plays with males playing the part of females, and we had very excellent uh, presentations. And generally, a show lasted one week, and everybody in the compound then could get into it one night. In the theater, there was a break about halfway back in the theater, and quite a wide aisle horizontally. <clears throat> and at the, back, at the back side of that aisle was an overstuffed Red Cross parcel box that had been made into a very comfortable chair. And the Austrian commandant, the German colonel, enjoyed the plays, and so generally one of the evenings he would attend the play, come in, take off his gloves, take off his dagger, and sit down, and all the prisoners would cheer, I, and I never knew why. <clears throat> all I knew that my roommate, Scott, was busy every day. He was in the security detail, so I'm sure something's going on, but it wasn't until after it was all over and I learned from Scotty that the entrance to the tunnel we were digging was that chair. So the night that the German colonel sat on the entrance, that's when we got the most digging done because the people who spend their time looking for tunnels didn't want to bother the colonel. So we were there until January of 1945. I was to be in the first American play. We were going to put on front page. And it was the night of the 25th that we were to open and it was on about the 24th that we began to suspect that the Germans were going to move us. We weren't too sure they weren't going to shoot us. We had heard that Hitler said the airmen were to be destroyed. <clears throat> so we had some plans to protect ourselves. We literally were digging that tunnel to the magazine of the German guards' compound. We were going to break into the magazine and, and uh, do what we could before they shot us. 
But finally on the 25th, we were told we had to get on the highway. It was a terrible winter. It's the coldest winter in the northern Europe of this century. There were about four feet of snow, and they got us on the road about three o'clock in the morning for my barracks. And I commanded the last barracks in the, in the column, so the snow was pretty well pushed down. We broke into the food supply, and we could take whatever food we thought we could carry. Uh, eight of us got together, and we built a sled. We built a sled with a harness to pull and a set of bars to push. And then we put the eight sets of rations on the sled so we were not as heavily loaded. And we had blanket rolls over our shoulders in which we put sugar, prunes, and things that are high, high value, uh, food value. So the eight of us made it all the way. Uh, the German guard, I walked at the head of the column and there was a German sergeant, Feltwebel, with a rifle. Uh, he actually spoke English. Uh, so he and I would converse as we were walking through the snow. It was terrible. Starting 3 o'clock in the morning, we walked all that day, all that night, all the second day. Uh, the, the second day, then, we arrived in a town that had a brick factory, and the furnaces were still going. So we got in out of the terrible cold, spent the night in the straw in this uh, brick factory. And we're back on the road the next morning again, and that night we went through a village, and they halted us, and then they told us to turn around and go back into a chapel. Well, because I'm leading the turnaround, we went into the chapel, and my people all got up on the pulpit and uh, the front end of the church. It's a beautiful little church for 200 people, and we put 2,200 in there that night. So we had them sleeping on the benches, we had them sleeping under the benches. I was sleeping with my head under the pulpit. Got us back on the road again, so we marched for six days. <clears throat> they gave us uh, bread, and as you went into a town, generally I could get my guard to go get a, a bucket of hot water. So we could take our frozen margarine, and we'd put the frozen margarine into the, into the hot water, and it made sort of a soup. And you could throw your prunes in there, too, and that would soften them up some because the prunes are frozen. But that's how we stayed alive. They issued some German bread. But it was terrible to see these people who sat by the side of the road. They said they felt fine, that they felt nice and warm all of a sudden. And I'd punch them, kick them, many of them twice as rugged as I am. And you could tell they're going to die. And then every so often you'd come along, and there's a guard. He's on the run. But behind us was a wagon and a horse, and they were picking up the guards, but they weren't picking up the prisoners. So on the sixth day, we arrived at a railroad siding. They put us into cars, and we were taken to Nuremberg. Nuremberg was an open city. It had never been bombed. We passed through Dresden on the 6th of February, and on the 13th of February, then, Dresden was bombed. It had been an open city. Thousands of people were living in the streets under makeshift tents. They were tied to the electric wires. They had their animals with them. Uh, and that is the Dresden into which the 8th Air Force bombed uh, on the 13th of February, which has been criticized in the books. Uh, the American answer is that the Russians considered it a transportation hub, which every city is. And so they asked the American 8th, Fo 8th Air Force to hit it to slow down the German retreat. So that's why it was bombed. Uh, Nuremberg had never been bombed. And on the 20th of February, then, we were bombed starting in the morning. And the camp we were in was less than two miles. It was just three kilometers from the railroad station. Our worst problem was, um, was the falling flak. You could go into trenches that we had dug but it literally was better to stay in the wooden barracks because the falling flak would go into the wood, set it on fire, but we could put the fires out pretty quickly. So no one really was hurt. That night, then, the Royal Air Force attacked. The city was still burning, and they attacked about 8 o'clock that night, and they dropped a bomb right outside of the fence where my barracks was and brought the... I was in a room that had a plastered ceiling, and it brought the ceiling down on us. So that was a terrible mess. Let's backtrack a little. How did you feel when your plane was on fire and you had to do all those different things and then finally bail out? 
Well, I think one thing about it is it has to do with your training, and if you're very well trained, you will just mechanically do what you ought to do. And that's the secret of getting training, and it was my 16th mission, so I'd been through this before, and I think you have great resolve uh, that you're going to get the mission done. Uh, actually, when I lost the first or the second engine, I probably could recommend that aircraft commander. We turned back and turned it over to the deputy. But turning to the deputy is, is a tough maneuver <clears throat> when you're in close and a large formation. But as I look back on it, I probably should have turned back you know, uh, run away and live to fight another day, but we didn't do this. Uh, so I think you have your dedication to getting the job done. I like the way my British roommates told me that they were flying for the king until bombs away. As soon as bombs away, they were flying for themselves. So I think I was concentrating on getting the bombs away as soon as I hear that. Now I begin to worry about your personal considerations. Uh, I had never given a thought to going out of the top hatch. Uh, I had given many briefings on how to parachute, but I really hadn't listened to them, I guess. So that was my first jump. Now, I had had some parachute training um, at the infantry center when we were cadets. Amazingly, as I went out of that airplane, that sergeant that had given me the instruction, there he was. And he told me how to turn myself around, that I should be drifting forward, and that I should get ready to chin myself but I should run quickly toward the chute after I hit the ground. And of all the 11 who jumped, uh, I'm the only one who didn't get hurt. Did everyone survive? No, two were killed on the airplane. How did it feel to be a prisoner of war? Well, I think it's difficult to tell you what it is. You know, one thing about it is that you have just faced death. And it's been very, very close. Within a minute after our getting out of that airplane, the aircraft commander getting out, that airplane blew. So I'm within one minute of having been killed, the same as those two young men in the rear. And so you have this, first of all, this feeling of relief. And even though you hurt, and I was burned, and they sting, uh, you know, you do have this relief that you're alive. Now, uh, for a professional guy, as I was, uh, you know, I'm a regular officer, uh, it, when there's a war on, that's the greatest professional opportunity to learn the fundamentals of the business you are in. So I think there's a professional disappointment that you no longer are in the war, that you're going to sit it out on the sidelines. Of course, the war was more intense. Uh, we were learning things every day, and the only way you learn them is with the pressure of combat. So I think it's, there's a professional disappointment. There's a personal disappointment. There's a personal satisfaction that, gosh, you're still alive. I had a wife and a child that I had never seen, so I had a consideration of why I wanted to live. So after Nuremberg, after the RAF bomb, what happened? That next morning, the Royal, uh, 8th Air Force returned again about 11 o'clock, and it takes about an hour and a half for the 8th Air Force to go over a target. So it's just a tremendous mess. Uh, everything is burning, bombs. They had brought 3,000 Russian prisoners into the city to clean it up during the night, and the 8th Air Force dropped into them. It's just a terrible mess. I went to an atom bomb test uh, years later, and all I can tell you is the atom bomb test was nothing compared to be bombed by the 8th Air Force. It's just tremendous. The earth shook every 15 or 20 seconds, and it lasted for an hour and a half. You'd wish they'd go away. And finally, they drone away. You got a terrible mess. And that literally is the last time I saw the 8th Air Force. Very shortly then, we were put on the road again. And this time, we marched straight south, 91 miles from Nuremberg to a place called Mooseburg, which is at the confluence of the Issa River and the Danube River. And that's uh, Stalag 13D. And I got there the first part of April. Uh, on the 29th of April, then, we were overrun by the 3rd Army. The unit was the 14th Armored Division, and their tank showed up early that Sunday morning. You could see them on the horizon. Suddenly, they're all over the place. Suddenly, they're in the wire, and suddenly, the American flag went up over the headquarters, and we were free. What did that feel like? Well, let's see. It's the end of a tremendous dream that uh, 
Someday you would be free, home alive in 45. So we then, uh, the compound commanders drew straws, and ours drew the straw of first to leave. So I was his operations officer, so I wrote the uh, op operations order for the first thousand prisoners to go back for uh, interrogation and clean up and issue of clothes and medical treatment. Uh, and we departed for uh, Camp Lucky Strike the first part of May. We were processed and we were put onto a ship on the 6th of May. It was going to sail the 7th of May and it was delayed one day and we sailed on the 8th, which is the day the war ended. It was a convoy. We came home by convoy, but about three quarters of the way, probably the 15th to 16th day, we had been in heavy fog and all of a sudden our ship just trembled and we could feel it go into reverse all of a sudden, but in the meantime, it was tremendous screeching. By the time I got on deck, we were up on top of an oil tanker and we were being backed off of it, slicing it, but there was no fire. And we stove in our bow and we quickly, with the prisoners helping the crew, we built a canvas bulkhead, strengthened it with wood from the inside. Then we were permitted to leave the convoy and we came home. It took us 22 days from La Harvard to New York. What was it like to be home? Oh, it was a great relief. And um, we knew that uh, we probably made a contribution. We literally, I don't think, uh, we, we weren't too proud of the fact that we'd been prisoners for some reason, I had a little feeling there was a stigma attached to it. So we literally didn't say much about having been prisoners. And in my military career, if somebody asked me, I would have talked about it. But I literally didn't say much about it. I think it really is the uh, tremendous difference of the prisoners of war who were prisoners of a different culture uh, in Vietnam that brought to a head uh, the terrible happenings of prison camps where you've got two, two societies, two cultures. The German Luftwaffe had sort of a professional respect for us, and I was called major by the captain who inspected our barracks. Um, we were not mistreated. They didn't have enough food, uh, but uh, there was no cruelty or anything like that involved. Now, they had punishments, and they had their rules, and they were very strict about their rules, and if you broke their rule, say, like putting your hand on the warning wire, the guard would fire. And in the, in the prison hospital I was there, a man came in, had a bullet in his hand. All he did was try to get up by putting his hand on the warning wire, and they shot him. What should people know about <coughs> prisoners of war from World War II? Well, uh, there is a Geneva Convention which uh, tried to get some order out of the chaos of past wars, of prisoners. Uh, people, if you read military history, generally uh, there's the so-called coup de grace, and anybody's wounded, uh, they just went through the wounded, and somebody just shot them. Uh, prisoners, if you thought you could make them work, certainly in the wars in Africa, which maybe we as whites encouraged the blacks to engage in wars to take prisoners, because the prisoners then were sold as slaves. So literally what happened to the poor black in Africa, he probably was captured in a war and he had a choice. Do you want to be killed or do you want to be a slave? So literally, um, that was his choice. And you can remember in Rome, uh, uh, the Roman legions bringing home slaves from countries uh, that they had overrun. But they tried to take the cruelty out of it. In our own American Civil War, the tremendous prison camp in the Carolinas at Andersonville where conditions were wretched. It was almost impossible to live through a prisoner of war experience in the American Civil War. So that was sort of straightened out by the Geneva Convention. So there are rules, I would say, and the Germans were signatories to the rules, and I would say in general they carried them out. Now you could see a difference in uh, services, and certainly if you were airmen uh, you got a harder time from the Wehrmacht, the German army, than you got from the Luftwaffe. How did you readjust after you came back? Joe, I'm pretty sure that uh, as a result of my experience in camp, that my mind was active. Uh, I had lots of things to do. I read a lot. I had to get my lessons ready. I took part in the plays. 
I had administrative uh, jobs to do in the camp. I was just plain busy. So I really never spent much time staring at the wire. Uh, and I think that if you keep yourself busy, uh, it's all right. Now you compare that to being put in a cell where you can't see anything except your cell, then that must do something to you mentally, which didn't happen to me. Uh, I came home, I was a regular officer and was assigned to the Pentagon for the first of three tours. Uh, I had jobs right away, uh, demanding jobs, interesting jobs. I was on the general staff when General Eisenhower was um, head of the general staff. I was an in intelligence, but in an administrative capacity, I was responsible for the air attache aircraft and crews of the air attache system. So I was still flying, I was still involved in airplanes, I was still involved in scheduling, even though I was a, uh, on the War Department general staff. My next assignment, when the Air Force separated from the uh, Army, was to be assigned to the office of the Secretary of the Air Force, which was probably one of the great opportunities in my life, that it was a very broadening experience. I worked for probably one of the greatest managers I've ever known, the Honorable W. Stuart Symington, who was the first Secretary of the Air Force. Although I was his paper shuffler, he gave me all kinds of jobs to do, and so it was a very interesting and, again, a very demanding job uh, and so I enjoyed it. I was busy, and I just never gave the prisoner of war experience uh, a thought. I just did not reflect on it. So it really doesn't seem to have bothered me. I forgot it. Uh, I went from uh, the secretary's office to the headquarters of Strategic Air Command, where I spent four years. Again, it was when SAC was uh, uh, going from a reciprocating engine air force to an all jet air force, and it was exciting times. And uh, I was, again, given special assignments by General May, very challenging assignments. I became his representative to Alfred Gunther, who was the Supreme Allied Commander in Paris. I uh, was sent by General May to work for the Field Marshal Montgomery. Uh, I came back uh, and was sent to uh, Salina, Kansas. There I became the division director of operations of a division that had two B-47 wings. I was sent to jet training in the B-47, the six-engine bomber. And one year later, I was given command of the 40th bomb wing, uh, B-47, B uh, medium jet, and took them immediately to England for 90 days. So they just were tremendously challenging jobs, and I just really didn't have time to reflect on uh, my prisoner of war experience. So I just don't think it bothered me. Now, I learned many things of being a prisoner and to have been responsible people, uh, for people in the camp. Because you see, man at his almost basic survival mode in prison camp. And you had to understand that people have deep emotional problems, particularly those who did nothing in the prison camp but sit there and stare at the wire. Uh, so I think it was a very great learning experience about humankind, uh, what drives people, why people really are all different, different, different strokes for different folks.